This is Rich Walkus with NFIP Training, here today to briefly talk to you about the October 2014 changes to the Flood Insurance Manual. These changes will become effective this October 1st, 2014. Changes to the Flood Insurance Manual usually occur every May 1st and October 1st. However, this year was a little bit different due to the recent legislation passed by Congress with manual changes occurring a little later this June 1st instead of May 1st. The Flood Insurance Manual will answer about 90% of the questions about flood insurance. Every insurance agent who writes flood insurance should have a current copy. Now, how do you get it? Just go to the web address you see on the screen and download it for free. Or you can simply Google Flood Insurance Manual and it will come up first in the list. Now, be sure to download the latest version, which is the October 2014 version. It downloads as a giant zipped PDF file. And remember, these changes don't take effect until October 1st, 2014. Before we start, some of you might ask, when I look at the manual, how can I tell what has changed in the manual? Well, that's pretty simple. Let's take a closer look at page 6 in the General Rules section. The pages where revisions have taken place have footers with October 1st, 2014 effective date. Also, you'll see a little black bar on the side of the page. That bar tells you that the verbiage next to it has changed from the previous manual. The solid change bars identify all updated information. Also, this October manual features hollow change bars. Now, these indicate where information was previously added in accordance with the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act of 2012, but subsequently removed to comply with the Homeowners Flood Insurance Affordability Act of 2014. Let me briefly describe the major changes, and then I'll go on in more detail later on. Here's a short list of what has changed. First, change affecting the general rules, application, PRP sections are new policy procedures concerning the proper documentation for a primary residence. In the general rules section, there is new guidance on the eligibility for a beneficiary of a trust for primary residence rating. Also in the general rules section, there is further guidance on named insured for tenants coverage. There's updated information on the photographic requirement for the transfer of elevation rated policies, again in the general rules section. And of course we have revised rate tables for policies written or renewed on or after October 1, 2014. This is especially important with the recent passage of the Homeowners Flood Insurance Affordability Act of 2014, which rolled back quite a few rates that were increased by the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Act. We'll talk about refund eligibility at this point. We have updates in the lowest floor guide section to the building drawing instructions to revise footnotes and rating guidance. There's also an addition of a new building drawing for a building with a subgrade crawl space and an attached enclosure or garage. In the Seabrist section are updates to the Coastal Barrier Resource System Communities list. In the CRS section of the manual are updates to the Community Rating System Eligibility Communities list and updates to the NFIP servicing agent contact information in the NFIP Bureau and Statistical Agent regional offices. This October 1st, new policy procedures in the general rules section concerning the prescribed documentation for a primary residence will become effective. As a result of the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Legislation of 2012, Subsidized rates for non-primary and business properties will see a planned 25% per year increases until they reach their full risk rates. So it's important to find what is meant by a primary residence. For rating purposes only, a primary residence is a building that will be lived in by the insured or the insured spouse for more than 50% of the 365 days following the policy's effective date. Now, this rule took effect 
this June 1, 2014. Now, prior to that date, the threshold was stated as at least 80% of the 365 days following the policy effective date. But let me repeat, this definition is for rating purposes only and not for loss settlement. To be eligible for the replacement cost loss settlement under the standard flood insurance policy, the dwelling must be the insured's principal residence, meaning that the insured must live in the dwelling for at least 80% of the 365 days preceding the loss, and the dwelling must be insured 80% or more of its full replacement cost, or the maximum amount of insurance available under the NFIP. If a dwelling only meets the definition of a primary residence and not the definition of a principal residence in the standard flood insurance policy, then any claim for building damages will be paid using actual cash value and not replacement cost value. In the October 2014 Flood Insurance Manual, the question, what is acceptable documentation for a primary residence status, is answered in the General Rules section. It requires at least one of the following. Homestead credit form for primary residence. A driver's license. An automobile registration. Proof of insurance for a vehicle. Voter's registration or documents showing where the children attend school. If documentation of a primary residence is not available when the policy is applied for on a newly purchased dwelling, the insurer must obtain a signed and dated statement from the applicant with the text below. The above dress is my primary residence and I and or my spouse will live at this location for more than 50% of the 365 days following the policy effective date. It further states, I certify under penalty of perjury under the laws of the United States of America that the foregoing is true and correct. I understand that any false statement may cause my policy to be void and may be punishable by fine or imprisonment under the applicable federal law. Write Your Own Bulletin W14048 recently published deals with this topic. It gives a sample letter and a form for insurers to use. It also states that the insurers can use this revised notice immediately and not wait for October 1st. Let's move on in the general rules section and talk about the clarification on the eligibility for a primary residence rating given to a beneficiary of a trust. If a trust is named on the policy and the beneficiary of the trust is using the building as a primary residence, the beneficiary of the trust must provide the standard documentation of primary residence we just discussed. In addition, the insurer must obtain documentation that that person is using the home as a primary residence, is the beneficiary of the trust, and is named as the insured. The grantor of the trust may also be eligible for the primary residence rating if the trust documents support that the grantor is a beneficiary of the trust with the right to live in the home. The grantor must submit both the trust documents and the standard documentation of primary residence. Then the insurer must obtain documentation that the grantor is the beneficiary of the trust named as the insured with the right to live in the home as a benefit. Now let's talk about changes in the tenant's coverage. The building owner must be named on the policy building coverage even if the policy is paid for by a tenant due to a lease agreement. The tenant may also be named on the policy. The NFIP does not designate any of the named insureds as primary or secondary. The rules intended to ensure that all parties with an insurable interest in the building are named on any claim settlement proceeds for building damages. However, coverage for contents owned by the tenant must be written on a separate policy in the name of the tenant only. Remember, duplicate coverage is not permitted under the NFIP, so only one policy can be issued for building coverage. 
Under the Transfer of Business section in the General Rules, we have updated information on the photographic requirement for transfer of elevation rated policies. After October 1st, all elevation rated policies being transferred that are effective on or after April 1st, 2015 will require photographs. The photographs on file with the previous insurer can be used if there have been no structural changes that affected the building's rating. This requirement will help to ensure proper rating of NFIP policies. Because the change was not included in the standard six months advance notice of program changes, FEMA will allow insurers to phase in the use of photographs for processing transfers on a voluntary basis through March 31, 2015. The photographic requirement must be applied for all transferred policies with the effective date on or after April 1, 2015. Revised rate tables now exist for policies written or renewed on or after October 1, 2014. You'll find these revised tables in the Rating section, Condo section, and Preferred Risk Policy section of the manual. The October 2014 rate changes revised premium rate tables to comply with Section 5 of the Homeowners Flood Insurance Affordability Act, which prohibits FEMA from increasing premiums more than an average of 15% per year within a single risk class and not more than 18% for an individual policy. In every case, the October 2014 rates are the same or lower than the October 1st 2013 premium rates. FEMA will also use these rate tables to calculate premium refunds required under the Affordability Act. To the extent that the policyholder was charged a premium in excess of the premium increase caps mandated under the Homeowners Flood Insurance Affordability Act, FEMA will use these rate tables to calculate the refund. Speaking of refunds, FEMA has created a handy refund fact sheet to help determine when a refund is appropriate. FEMA has also created a fact sheet on the impact of the recent legislation on the business community. Now moving on to the lowest floor guide of the manual. We see it has revisions and updates to the building drawing instruction to revise footnotes and rating guidance to comply with the Homeowners Flood Insurance Affordability Act of 2014. On page 37 of the lowest floor guide section of the manual, there has been an addition of a new building drawing. Now this building is described as having a subgrade crawl space in an attached enclosure or garage. Of course, the October 1st Flood Insurance Manual has updates to the Coastal Barrier Resource Systems Community List and updates to the list of the eligible communities for the Community Rating System. And what October 1st Flood Insurance Manual change would be complete without updates to the NFIP Servicing Agent Contact Information and the NFIP Bureau and Statistical Agent Regional Offices. We've come to the end of our October 1st, 2014 manual changes. This is Rich Walk as for NFIP training, saying thank you for getting with the program, the National Flood Insurance Program.